On today's episode, we have Ricky Sinhouse Jr. asking for his dad. Bob Pockers got stuck in Cloverfield, and Scott McLaughlin went really fast and got to hold a trophy. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show. My name is Matt. We're going to continue with this format. Somewhere around 22 minutes is what we're looking for. Kind of like a TV show, half an hour TV show for what it's worth. I had a lot of fun with this format last week. People seem to like it, so we'll stick with it. On Sunday night, NASCAR had their all-star race for the Cup Series. Kyle Larson had to fly in from North Wilkesboro. NASCAR moved back the start of the race 16 minutes to 8.30 from 8.14. And for some reason, people had a big issue with that, saying that, you know, this jeopardizes the integrity of the sport, looking at you, Pete Pistone. This is where we want to draw the line about the integrity of the sport. This is totally fine. It's an exhibition race. Who cares? If they wanted to run the cars in reverse with monster truck tires, I wouldn't care because this race does not matter at all. But on Sunday night, they did attempt to run a soft tire. And that's what everybody wants to talk about, right? After this race is the soft tire. No, nobody cares about the soft tire right now because everybody wants to talk about Ricky Stenhouse Jr. and Kyle Busch. Kyle Busch wrecks Ricky Stenhouse Jr. on purpose on lap two. Stenhouse, not happy about it, goes and parks in the number eight pit box. Then he climbs up on the pit box, says something to Randall Burnett, the crew chief of the eight car. And then Andy Petrie, as Ricky's climbing down, just goes and shrugs. Andy Petrie has become maybe the most unlikable guy in NASCAR recently. It's perplexing to see how his career trajectory has gone. But Stenhouse then is stuck in the infield of the racetrack for the next 198 laps because... Well, there's no crossover tunnel at North Wilkesboro. It's an old racetrack. So those 198 laps go by, and he's still angry about it. And he said just as much that he was going to deal with this after the race. And Ricky stood on business because Kyle comes around the corner, and there's Ricky standing outside the eight hauler like he's a character in The Outsiders just getting ready for a, a fight at any moment. Stenhouse comes over to him. They have a discussion. Ricky balls up his fist and apparently did not go to the Ross Chastain School of Boxing because he delivered a pretty weak punch to the side of Kyle's head. And then all the complete chaos ensued. Bob Pockers is running around. His camera somehow flipped back to his face, and he was just completely shocked by the entire situation. Uh, Davey Siegel ends up on his back from Sirius XM NASCAR. Uh, he gets knocked over. Ricky and Kyle Busch both get yanked in opposite directions. Both of them trip over tires and end up on their backs. Ricky's yelling to get his dad. Uh, th whatever the NASCAR security guard uh, guy is that grabbed Ricky and like put him in a suplex like it was WrestleMania in the 80s, you can't do that. That was just over-the-top aggressive. Sinhouse Jr. is over there trying to town on Kyle's face. Kyle gets him back. The JTG guys get on top of the lift gate for the eight car. They're leaning over the ropes, putting Kyle in a headlock. It was chaos. You had one RCR team member there in the eight team. He was throwing people off. He had locked down defense. This guy had to have played college football somewhere. His form was immaculate. He was defending the back of the eight truck like it was a U.S. embassy and somebody was trying to storm it. This man was not letting anybody get around. And then you have Kyle at the very end yelling at Ricky, and he's like, basically, look at what you started. And then he says, bring it. <laughs> I suck like you suck. So that couldn't have made the eight team feel very great there. Just chaos at the end of it. And honestly, NASCAR needed it because what we saw on track wasn't the best thing. Maybe in person it was better, but the Fox broadcast certainly didn't do it any favors because it was a lot of Joey Logano leading and then not much else happening. Uh, the soft tire, we'll talk about tires now. NASCAR brought, or Goodyear rather, brought their softest compound ever. It's essentially the wet weather tire without the tread on it. And it was the red sidewall tire. It was faster, right? It seemed to be the preferred tire for sure. The problem is it never really wore out. It wore out, but it didn't have this drop off that they were expecting. I will say this about North Wilkes Pro and its repave. It's one of the better repaves we've seen in recent years. Is it still too thin? Is the surface coming up? Yeah, that was a big concern for everybody, even up until race time. They obviously laid a new patch of asphalt down in turns one and two, right on the groove for the right side tires in the bottom lane. So the, yeah, there was con some concern about it. Track held up fine. It was multiple grooves. Don't get me wrong. There were people running middle, bottom, top. It was great. Kyle Larson put on a show there in the last 50 laps when he put on fresh tires and was able to charge up to third, ultimately ends up finishing fourth after starting at the back, flying in from Indianapolis. We'll get to that in a second. But the tire did its job. It just didn't do what I think people were hoping it would. But everybody keeps saying, you know, the tire did a great job. The tire did a great job. Goodyear did a good job. It's like everybody 
knows that it wasn't that great, but we have to keep encouraging Goodyear. Like they're, you know, like when a little kid falls down and you have to tell them they're not hurt. And if you don't, they start crying. So you're just like, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're doing great. Even though you're like, oh man, kind of mangled up right there. That feels like what this is going on where everybody's like, hey, you guys did a great job. You did a great job. Bring this tie around again because we don't want them to revert back because if you had what we saw on the truck series race, truck series race is actually pretty good. Tire did not wear out at all. And that is a big problem. I will say this. I think if we had last year's surface pre-repave with this soft tire, we're talking about a completely different race. Yeah, passing the leader was impossible, mainly because Joey Logano got 800 laps of testing here during a tire test, which, whatever. I mean, everybody gets to do a tire test, right? Like, so NASCAR can, or, you know, the teams and manufacturers decide who's going to do the tire test. Logano got 800 laps here. Other people did as well. They just really seem to capitalize on it. And are the Fords fully back? That eh, certainly seems like it. They came within one one thousandth of a second of winning at Kansas. They win at Darlington with Brad. They've now won the All-Star Race. Will they show up at the Coke 600 and surprise everybody again like they did last year when Ryan Blaney won it? Remains to be seen. But the tire was better. It was a step in the right direction. It, it wasn't the panacea. It wasn't the fix-all for the problems that we've been having but it was a step in the right direction. So I'm glad to see everybody like encouraging Goodyear, like, hey, bring this tire to Loudon, bring this tire to Richmond, bring this tire to everywhere because we need softer tires that are going to wear out. Because even during the heat of the day, when they had practice on Saturday, the tire was blistering. So there is going to be fall off with this tire. This tire does wear just at night on a new fresh repave. It didn't seem to have the same effect that you know people were hoping for, especially when you can run 100 laps on the tire and it still be perfectly fine. That's unfortunate to say the least. So yeah, there's still some work to be done on the tire side. On the Kyle Larson side, I don't know if anybody's getting tired of the Kyle Larson story yet, but it seems to have brought all NASCAR fans together. Uh, it feels a lot like the Garage 56 program last year for the 24 hours of Le Mans when you know, Chevy took over and Hendrick Motorsports took over that big boy Camaro and stormed around the Malson Straits like nobody's business. Kyle Larson's attempt at the double now seemingly has brought everybody together. Everybody wants to see Kyle Larson do well. It's a fun story. And I saw some people being like, why are people as hyped for this, but they weren't as hyped for Kurt Busch? Well, Kurt Busch certainly doesn't have the same notoriety as Kyle Larson does. Kurt Busch was 10 years removed from being a NASCAR Cup Series champion. He wasn't leading the points at the time, and he was a kind of at a career crossroads, for lack of a better term. He you know, had given himself the outlaw nickname when he was dating that uh, Driscoll lady. I can't remember what her first name was. Patricia, maybe. And everything about it was like, it was great. Don't get me wrong. I love seeing Kurt Busch do it, and he was super impressive at the Indianapolis 500. But when you have Kyle Larson doing it, 2021 NASCAR Cup Series champ, current NASCAR Cup Series points leader in the prime of his career, right? And I think that's the biggest part right there. He's literally never been better than he is right now. This like three year stretch that he's been on has been, I mean, books will be written about his last three to five years, including what happened in 2020, of course. So what he's the run he's been on here is captivating. He's if he doesn't win most popular driver, I'll be shocked by that because the guy is getting more cheers than Chase Elliott is. He's selling so much merch. I cannot stress enough how much merch Kyle Larson, that five team Kyle Larson, the 17 IndyCar team, Kyle Larson, the dirt racer is moving. There's a ton of Kyle Larson merch out there. I mean, I was at Indianapolis 500 qualifying on Saturday. I bought a Kyle, Kyle Larson diecast. I even got in on the hype just because I thought it was a cool, I liked the attempt at the double. So we added a new diecast to the shelf back here. At the end of the day though, everybody wants to see Kyle do well. It's cool to see crossovers. It encourages more people to do crossovers. I want to see an IndyCar guy come over and do the Coke 600. Like it'd be cool to see. So Kyle goes out there as a rookie, puts in the fastest lap time ever for a rookie in Indianapolis 500 qualifying, be beating out Benjamin Peterson from last year. He qualifies fifth in his first Indianapolis 500. Team Penske, of course, locked out the front row, which there's just nothing compelling about the best team in the series owned by the series owner at the racetrack he owns after a massive cheating scandal. Nobody, I, I don't think does... Is anybody like, oh man, this is so cool? I'm sure there are like Team Penske homers out there and Team Penske fans, and like, good for good for them. So be it. But for me, from like a storyline standpoint, it's not that fun. It, it's not that impressive. Scott McLaughlin's cool. I like Scott, but Joseph Newgarden is a 
a corporate shill at this point. And then you have Will Power, and Will's cool as well. But again, there's nothing cool about Team Penske. So that part remains up in the air. But for Larson, qualifies fifth. He'll be starting middle of the second row next Sunday at the Indianapolis 500. He'll have his teammate Alexander Rossi to his inside, and Santino Ferrucci to his outside. And yeah, the guy has been super impressive. After not getting many laps on Thursday, he goes out on Fast Friday and starts laying down laps. He goes out on Saturday, has that plenum issue on his first attempt. Everybody's like, oh man. Then he goes out in the heat of the day, lays down an absolute flyer. And you're like, oh, Kyle Larson's going to be in the Fast 12 easily. Easily was in the Fast 12. And then he qualifies for the Fast 6, which is great. And yeah, it was a phenomenal attempt at the Indianapolis 500 for Kyle Larson. He'll now, like I said, be starting fifth on Sunday in the 108th running of the Indianapolis 500, which is crazy to think about. P5, he needs to spend Monday's practice from 1 to 3 and Friday's practice from 11 to 1 just running in traffic. He's really got to understand how to time the passes, how to run in traffic, and everything that goes along with that because he didn't get a ton of that on Thursday. He got some of that on Wednesday in practice. But for Kyle Larson, super cool. Jeff Gordon was there. Jeff Gordon looks like a proud dad. Uh, Kyle Larson's entire family was there. We saw them on pit road on Saturday. But his surrogate dad at this point, Jeff Gordon, living vicariously through Kyle Larson. Jeff Gordon not doing the double is something I think he'll probably always regret because he would have been so good at it. And now he's following Kyle around and, you know, helping Kyle live out his dreams. And the dude was pumped. It was just wholesome to see Jeff Gordon that happy for Kyle Larson. And uh, yeah, it was a cool moment. And then, of course, he traveled uh, Sunday night from Indianapolis 500 qualifying, took off in the helicopter from the golf course outside of turn two. As he's lifting off, Scott McLaughlin starting his lap. It was a pretty cool shot that I believe Nick Yeoman or somebody from IndyCar Radio tweeted out a photo of. Uh, Just a cool picture in general there. Lands in North Carolina at Wilkes County Regional, flies a helicopter into North Wilkesboro, gets there probably, what, like 45 minutes before the race time? Like, had plenty of time to spare. Had enough time to get on the Fox broadcast and talk to them. So, overall, it's really cool that he's attempting the double. Now we'll see what he can do when we get to Indianapolis 500 qualifying. Speaking of qualifying real quick, Scott McLaughlin got the pole. Uh, Will Power will be second. Joseph Newgarden third, the second time a team has locked out the front row. The last time it happened, I believe, was like 1988. Team Penske did it as well. Uh, There was a Rick Mears win that year for him. Maybe history will repeat itself. Maybe Scott McLaughlin can take that yellow submarine to victory lane. The wait and see here. But he has a great relationship with Rick Mears. Nolan Siegel is the one driver that does not qualify for the Indianapolis 500. The 19-year-old who flipped over earlier in the week in practice then goes out on Sunday is locked in because Marcus Erickson pulled a Mark Martin, forgot how to count, and bailed on his attempt after the third lap, thinking that was the end of his four-lap run. It was not. So he sat around until about seven minutes ago. Marcus goes out, puts himself into the field, bumps Nolan Siegel out. Nolan goes back out. And for a 19-year-old kid, no fear. No attack, no chance, like Takuma says. And he went out there, big balls, sent it, touches the wall on the exit of turn one, broke the toe link and then he crashed into turn two he was fine he got out bummer to see that bummer to see his parents you know looking distraught afterwards because they just watched their kid wreck an indycar at indianapolis for the second time in the matter of like three days uh, which is less than ideal but yeah for nolan siegel it's a bummer he'll be back Catherine leg graham ray hall marcus erickson that will be your last row interesting to see how race running practice goes on both monday and friday Uh, we'll learn a lot more about the handling of these race cars and who probably has the best car for race conditions when Sunday rolls around. Now it's time for the Stephen Wallace Dumb Move of the Week. Last year, we had an ARCA driver driving into the attenuator trying to come to pit road. We had a safety truck T-boning Bobby Timmons up in the Northeast. This week, after... The absolute monsoon that hit North Wilkesboro, the flooding, the teams having to push their cars out of a flood zone, essentially. Christian Eck is walking out of the water in one of the most cinematic moments. The race gets restarted on Sunday at 1130, and during one of the pit stops, Stuart Friesen comes in to pit, 
reaches, a crew member goes around to the passenger side of the truck, reaches in and pulls an entire backpack out of the passenger side of the race truck because somebody forgot to take their backpack out. And I guess Stewart's not taking his kid to school during the middle of this race. They threw it over the wall. But like, how does a backpack get left in a race truck as the race is about to go on? Maybe the other dumb move of the race uh, would be for Ricky Stenhouse Sr. He's probably going to get his hard card pulled uh, after going over there and trying to town on Kyle Busch's face like he was Tom Logano, except took it to another level. Speaking of Tom Logano, he ran out on the front stretch during Joey Logano's Victory Lane interview, and he was he was happy, for which is great to see. And he's like, there's three generations of Loganos out here because uh, Joey's kid was out there, which is cool. But where did Tom come from? He came out of nowhere. This is a different Tom Logano. I mean, at one point, he was trying to fight people at Fontana, at Pocono. NASCAR was constantly like, we're going to take your hard card away. They did take his hard card away at one point. He was fired up. Now we got Ricky's dad out here trying to do his best Tom Logano impersonation. It's not even Halloween yet, but this is a story for another day. One thing I want to talk about, though, before we get to looking ahead, things I would change right now. After having spent another year at Indianapolis 500 qualifying, if you haven't been, go. They raise the price up to $30. I don't love that for a single day ticket, but it's still a great bargain. And it's still one of the most entertaining things that you can do. The crowd's electric. The speeds are high. The facility is immaculate. Roger has actually done a great job with the facility. As much as we trash him for how bad he's been as an IndyCar owner, as an owner of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, everything is Penske perfect. Parking lots got paved, paint has been updated, bathrooms are clean, the concession prices are too high, the pork tenderloin is not a pork tenderloin anymore, it looks more like a chicken sandwich, don't love that, but for the most part, the rest of it is all pretty top notch, so hats off to him. But when I'm sitting there watching Indianapolis 500 qualifying and how great the broadcast does it, how much fun it is in person, how invested the entire crowd is, they had 90,000 people over the course of two days show for qualifying, which is the most they've had in quite some time, beat last year's uh, you know, recent record. It's mind-boggling to me that NASCAR's Daytona 500 does not have something like what the Indianapolis 500 has in terms of qualifying. My idea for the Daytona 500 qualifying, because right now, nobody cares about watching restricted cars go out there and run around and just run on the bottom. There's nothing intriguing about that. There's no record that they're chasing to be broken. The whole broadcast is really lame. The tracker on the screen ruins any sort of surprise and dramatic moment. My idea for Daytona 500 qualifying is give them back their practice sessions in the week leading up to qualifying. Give them three, you know, three two-hour practice sessions. Then you take the uh, tapered spacer off the cars. You run unrestricted engines. You allow them to chase the speed and lap record, right? It becomes an entertaining way more entertaining than what we're currently watching you now have guys hitting 230 240 mile per hour or whatever it is yeah there's a safety aspect to it yes we'd have to take a look at you know all of that so just take your literal side of the brain just put it over here pat it it's going to be okay for a second let's just speak hypotheticals because right now at the indianapolis motor speedway when you're there or when you're watching on television and they complete their first lap and that number pops up and it says 234.8 or whatever it is the crowd erupts and everybody's like oh massive number for you know whoever imagine doing that for nascar make it a two lap average at daytona 500 or you can make it a four lap average i don't really care but imagine that number popping up and everybody being like he's on it like there's a chance that he's going to you know take pole or set the record or do anything and then you can whittle that down to your fast 10 or whatever you want to call it on the nascar side and they can have that be an attempt you know at the run for pole and then you can have your last row shootout whoever is going to start 39th and 40th and then you have you know four or six cars battling for those two positions absolutely fantastic yeah it kind of negates the purpose of the duels but the duels really are, haven't been that exciting and if you really want to have it maybe you just have it break down if there's 46 cars show up you have you know 42 spots and then two people or one person from each duel will end up going home something along those lines and then when you're ready to go into the race then you put the taper spacer back on and you go back to your pack racing like you've always had at daytona and talladega or at least you know have always had in for the last 25 ish years how we know it and then you go for there. 
but they have to do something to try to make Daytona 500 qualifying better. Make it make it an event you want to tune into because everybody wanted to tune in and watch, you know, the Fast 6 on Sunday evening when they went out to run. Are they going to post the big times? Are they going to break, break the track record? Will they break the four lap average record? There's so many different storylines for it. And Daytona 500 qualifying has absolutely none of them. And they could make it entertaining. Make it something people want to watch. Because right now, I don't care about Daytona 500 qualifying. And I consume tons of racing content. Like, all the racing content. And when Daytona 500 qualifying comes on, I didn't even watch it this past year, actually. I was out. Like, I don't really care about what happens here. Because why would you? So, make a change. Make it entertaining. Do something. Looking ahead for this week. Obviously, the biggest things coming up this weekend is what people refer to as Motorsport Christmas. There's other race weekends that are just as good as this in terms of having all three major series on at the same time. But you get a NASCAR crown jewel in the Coke 600, the biggest race in the world, the Indianapolis 500. 325 plus thousand people will be there, including myself. On Sunday, if you're going, leave early and whatever time you thought you were leaving early leave earlier than that so you can get there in time and then of course you have the formula one parade in monaco for its yearly tradition of well did you get the pole on saturday you get the win as well unless you're ferrari of course but yeah i'm really excited about this upcoming weekend the coke 600 in the gen 7 era has been an absolute banger the last two years fully expect it to be once again the indianapolis 500 has tons of intrigue around it um will scott mclaughlin get his first win in the indy 500 will joseph newgarden go back to back what about kyle larson can alexander rossi who is sick and tired of hearing about team penske do something about it on sunday a pissed off alexander rossi is good for everybody it will be highly entertaining and then the ganassi cars will they show up as well and then on the formula one side you know can mclaren beat red bull to the pole at monaco i think there's a solid chance at this point we'll have to wait and see what's going on with that but you also have arca and trucks on friday night xfinity on saturday it is a major racing weekend for everybody and hopefully you can tune in or go to some of it as well so i will be back next week for the break hard show to talk about everything that's going to happen until then Let me know if you like the format still, what things you would change on it in the comments or comment on literally anything else I said, specifically Daytona 500 qualifying. If you think that's a good idea or a bad idea, remember, hypothetically speaking, of course, like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.